Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. This is Wayne Callen for Attitude Magazine. Glad you can be with us for another Experts webinar. I doubt if there are any parents raising a child with ADHD who haven't struggled with screen challenges or looked high and low for solutions. Yeah, you ask your teen to step away from the cell phone to join the family for dinner, and you get a blank stare or bare acknowledgement that you've asked him something. Parents sometimes get angry and are often frustrated. Today's topic, screen time and the ADHD brain, will address a sore spot in many households with children diagnosed with ADHD. There are all kinds of studies decrying the overuse of screens and their effect on your teen's brain and the rest of his life. Some researchers say that the constant stimulation and instant rewards of games raise the bar for kids to pay attention in normal, less stimulating situations where you have to work harder to get rewards. Another and perhaps bigger problem is that all that screen time means time not spent doing other things more valuable for their development, including interacting with the family and friends. Still another study suggests that kids with the most severe ADHD symptoms are most drawn to video games. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends an hour per day of total media screen time for elementary school children and two hours for kids in secondary school. Problem is, American children currently average more than six hours of screen time per day. We are very lucky to have Wes Crenshaw with us today to sort this all out and give us strategies to manage our teens' screen time more successfully. He has worked with hundreds of teens and young adults and their parents at his clinic, Family Psychological Services, in Lawrence, Kansas. He is the author of I Always Want to Be Where I'm Not, Successful Living with ADD and ADHD, and the forthcoming book, ADHD and Zombies. You can reach him at www.drdr-wes.com. Wes, it's great to have you here today. Nice to be here, Wayne. So the electronic devices, you can't look at them as evil entities here to take over our minds. They do feel that way sometimes, um, especially uh, I've been having problems with my neck. And I was an early adopter of computers clear back in 1982. And so I've been leaning over these things for most of my life. And just one of the health problems that comes with the screens is neck problems. We're seeing more and more of these. So it's very easy to uh, see them as not only mentally um, problematic, but physically problematic for us. But you can't just see them that way, especially when it comes to teens, because these are not only the wave of the present, they're the wave of the future. And for kids to be able to really meaningfully interact with their environment now or in the next uh, 10 or 20 years, they're going to have to be able to master these technologies. But they have to do it uh, with critical thinking skills and with an understanding of the problems that they all bring with them. So they can be what I call either super tools or super distractions, and we'll hit uh, all of those here in a moment. Um, one of, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about how cameras can be used effectively. They're not just for um, videotaping your cat falling off the couch, although that is fun. I have one of those. You can see her on my website. Um, but they're also for archiving data. And for folks with ADD, and I have two of them in my uh, home, they, these are valuable tools. Uh, they help you so many ways. We'll discuss how to do that. Um, video gaming, I, I, n I never get the kind of blowback when I'm on a radio show, talk show, never get people attacking me just full bore. And I'm talking public radio where everybody's nice. It, it Never is it as bad as when I talk about video games. People just go to town on me. Video games are very precious to more than just the teenagers. We'll talk about why and why it's problematic, especially for folks in the ADD crowd. Um, talk about making an ethics manual. The minute you have, and by the way, this is so common. It just came up as the last session of my day yesterday. It's that common every week. How do you hand over a device to a kid and set 
parameters for it. I call that the the uh, ethics manual, and I'm going to tell you exactly the points you've got to hit. And I and I, I apologize if any of this is obvious. I don't find it to be so. Plenty of folks, well-educated, thoughtful, reflective people come in and do not have a clue about how to go about this when they hand over the phone. And I just turned my iPhone 6 Plus over to my son this week, um, and uh, I have very immediate experience of what this is like. Uh, Part of that ethics manual is placing screen time within a larger day. This is not how young people, or maybe some of us not so young, think about these devices as existing in a larger day. For many kids and young adults, these become their day. Now, that, again, sounds terribly, terribly evil, but it has some benefits in terms of how kids can interconnect socially, but it has plenty of downsides. And the only thing that stands between your kid and the downsides and the super distractions is this um, process of learning to be self-regulating, setting the ethics manual and then being self-regulating. And of course, for folks with ADHD, self-regulation is a core problem. It's a core struggle. That's why this is an even more relevant topic for that crowd. And finally, I will show you um, both in this webinar, and I'll refer to a TV uh, show we did this week on how to build your very own electronic cookie jar. I am, I, in the, in my book, uh, always want to be where I'm not. I talk about the difference between shortcuts and workarounds. And a shortcut is a way to mess things up because you're cutting corners, you're doing things that are are not going to work out as well. They're not thorough. Well, a workaround is a way to make something easier to do, but still to do it. The cookie jar is what I would refer to as a workaround. A lot of the things that we want you to do in filtering and controlling the devices for kids are, are kind of complicated. I'm a pretty good IT guy and I know how to do some of this and even I find it burdensome. So I came up with the dumbest system possible to really isolate phones and it's super easy and it's not the kind of thing that the smart kids we all have with technology can just simply defeat. So we're going to talk about that. So Let's talk first about the, these devices as super tools. They are magnificent for folks with ADD in so many ways. First of all, just the simple little notes app. And, and I, I got to say, going into this, there is a gender difference between boys and girls and how they approach this. Guys really are better at adopting a lot of these tools. And young women just love their paper documents. And I... I'm torn about this because on one hand, I want to honor this need to touch this paper document and to color code it. You know, they have all these pretty pens they use. And, you know, if class is uh, about biology, they color that green. And this makes a lot of sense to young women. And I'm talking again, I, I see people with a lot of different diagnostic categories, but particularly for the ADD young women. They have these systems on paper. I I don't want to argue with them about this, but I got to say putting that into an electronic format has some value. For example, with notes apps, you just simply tie this in with your computer and your phone through iCloud or Google or any cloud-based system. And all of that material, if I, I sit here on my computer and type in or upload for my books, I will upload articles I read and they will sit in my notes app and wait for me to go back and use them in books, all of that on my phone and my computer join together so that I can get to it anytime. That's helpful for the ADHD folks because then whatever they need immediately, they can archive it and have it available. Having things all talk to each other, very helpful. We'll talk about that again in a second with calendaring. Cameras, the the ability, and, and many people have mastered this as adults, I, we need to really work with kids to think about it. Every assignment a kid finishes, they should take a picture of, a readable picture. And I just got the, I, I was one of those iPhone 10 people that, you know, ordered it and waited forever and it came. The quality of those cameras is amazing. Same with the eights that they have. You can get a clean picture of the document you finish. Well, why do you want to do that? 
First of all, some of you may not realize this, but <laughs> your kids lose their assignments. If you have a picture of it, a teacher will generally take that in lieu of the actual document. If they don't, if a teacher doesn't want to take that or doesn't want to do electronic submission, go to your school and get an accommodation. You don't have to have a full-on IEP to do this. You can either have what's called a 504 or a student improvement plan. And it simply says either the kid will submit all of the materials electronically or will submit them as a backup to paper documents. That's how my daughter got through high school, and she's a 4.0 student in college now uh, because she had pictures of everything. So when the cat ate it or whatever, she had electronic backup. Cameras can be used to, as reminders. They can be used uh, in, to uh, document uh, items the person needs for class. A lot of kids with ADD respond better to pictures than words. And so if they think, okay, I need to remind myself of what to do in the morning before I go to school, take a picture of it and put it in a sequence and boom, 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 you go right down the list and it's done. And you can put those pictures in your notes app or wherever you want them to go back and stimulate memory. Um, To-do lists, a lot of folks with ADD love to check the box and say, I did this. There are apps. This is my least, the area I've worked the least in. But uh, to-do lists, there are apps for that. There are ones that give you a little, you know, reward when you've uh, done the thing on the list. If that fits well for you or your kid, great. Um, I prefer calendaring because calendaring is sets a time ahead of time for when you're supposed to do the task. So I will put go to Home Depot. And believe me, I go to Home Depot all the time. So it tells me to go to Home Depot. And on my Home Depot event in my calendar, I put what I'm going to buy. There's even an app now, I can't think what it's called, but you can put it in buy two by fours. And when it knows that you've arrived at Home Depot from geopositioning, it will send that message to you. You need to buy two by fours. I've not tested that app, but that's a brilliant idea. You put in buy cold medicine at Walgreens. And when you walk into Walgreens, boom, it's going to remind you. This could be a great tool for ADHD folks. Um, And I call it multipoint calendaring because, again, you can tie it into your phone and your computer through Google or iCloud. And it's much easier to fill in what you're going to do on your events calendar and then have it come back to you on the phone. We have this for the for our family. Uh, I have two or three different server accounts that I use for business and for the family. So I can just put events in for my daughter at college, come by and visit you. I can fit it into her class schedule. And then when she sees that on the calendar, she knows what we're going to do. We're going to go to dinner. We're going to go to a show, whatever it may be. You can uh, If you can get kids to calendar that way, Uh, then you can also be part of the process of scheduling their time because you can just get on the master calendar on your computer and help kind of organize their time. And that, uh, once you get that mastered when they're, say, in middle school, then it continues on pretty nicely thereafter. Um, And I always tell my daughter, if you have something on there you don't want me to see, put it on a different calendar. Kids have the right to some privacy. So public calendaring doesn't have to be for everything. Uh, Texting is a useful tool to keep in touch with people. Of course, as you know, I suspect kids don't text near as much anymore. That used to be the thing. And now they Snapchat. And I, I refuse to Snapchat. But texting has been very valuable as a therapy tool. It's valuable for for uh, uh, for journaling. We never used to really be able to get kids to journal. We just said we did. And now journaling Uh, is very effective through texting. And also you can send yourself reminders. If you don't want to use the notes app, uh, you can text yourself reminders of things to do. Um, Being able to access online materials, both from phones and calendars is tremendous for education and information. I have a whole chapter of my newest book, which is actually called Consent-Based Sex Education, where we go into the good and the bad of what's online for kids about sexuality. And it really is uh, a tremendous area for information and a tremendous area for misinformation. But being able to access that kind of material for kids with ADHD can be very, very helpful across the board. It also helps with uh, critical thinking and socialization for kids. I know people think 
social media is sort of this like not like it distracts from real relationships. I absolutely do not think that is true. Those are very real relationships. And for some kids that are very awkward and some of those who are on the spectrum, this is really an, <laughs> the most important environment for them to get to know people. And many of those kids feel safer online than they do in their middle school or high school. Now, you know, you may have heard things that scare you about that, and that's some of that is legitimate. But the bottom line is they probably are safer online than in their middle school because those relationships are at some distance. Now, there's a lot more to say about that we don't have time for, but I'm pointing out some of the best things. And finally, uh, spying. You can spy on your kids really effectively. We just had this issue this week in my office, and I say, for heaven's sakes, use that sparingly because uh, – the more knowledge you have, the more you think you have to act, and then you reveal how much you're spying. And kids, as they age, need to gain some ability to manage privacy. And uh, spying something one should do when there is no other alternative and that you think the kid is at some very imminent risk. So the distractions are also many. Um, for all of the things I just described are just way, way too interesting when compared to reality. Uh, that's particularly true in gaming. There's a thing we call micro-achievements, and there's a brand new um, article out in Time Magazine this morning. I read it off of my Apple News, of course, on my phone, and uh, where I was gaining critical thinking and socialization. Uh, you you want to read that article. It's a young woman who talks about um, her use of video games and pornography and how that grew to what she refers to as an addiction. I'm very, very, very careful how much I say people are addicted to anything because we overuse that term. She makes a very clear case in there for her reaching behavioral addiction, and she explains why. Good article to take a look at. And she talks about why gaming was so interesting. She doesn't happen to use the word microachievements, but she talks about it in the same way. And micro-achievements, particularly for the ADHD folks, are a serious problem. We're currently um, remodeling our bathroom, and I mean down to the studs and up to the rafters. We're putting in a vaulted ceiling and a skylight. So my 14-year-old son, has been, who is very ADD, uh, has been helping with this, and um, he's impressed with the work we're doing. We're you know putting in all these beams and re- uh, doing insulation and making sure that it vents correctly and everything. And when we're done, I feel this great sense of satisfaction that we are doing this great thing together. For my son to have the very same experience of satisfaction, he just has to flip on Minecraft or whatever and get on there and do this thing, and he will feel the same chemical experience I feel for all this hard work we put in. That's a micro-achievement. Video games trick your brain into thinking you've actually done something. See, this is why people call up the radio shows and attack me. <laughs> I always check to see if they flatten my tires when I leave the building because people like that feeling. They like to feel like they've achieved something, and they've really only killed a lot of aliens in a video game. Now, I have nothing against that fun, enjoyable experience, but it doesn't get the bathroom remodeled. And too many young people, particularly boys in the article I was describing, it was a girl, but particularly boys, become so enamored with that feeling of doing nothing and feeling like you've done something that this is what becomes addictive to them. They like the feeling and they become attached to it and they do not get up and do what needs to be done. Girls, to some extent, do this with social media. I do not see that as nearly as, uh, as broad a problem, but it does also happen. And what you get is what I re was referred to as a wish fulfillment and fantasy ver versus the actual solving of the problem. The other thing, uh, I said how great the information is online. If anyone has missed the memo on fake news the last couple of years, we now understand that... Um, there's a lot of stuff that's not only not true online, but is influenced by malign forces in the world. The goal of which is to change our perspectives by feeding us false information. Kids, fortunately, are becoming more savvy about this than adults. Kids 
are better at spotting fake news than adults are. We need to really support that and help kids to understand in their consuming of online life what's real and what isn't. There's a reason why the TV show Catfish is still so popular. If you've never seen that film, I can't believe what a phenomenon this is, but that's because they're always investigating what's real and what's fake online. And that's a good show. Kids, if you say something about catfish, kids immediately know what you're talking about. And finally, particularly amongst the young women, primarily amongst young women, social media is is equal to drama. You're going to have a lot of distraction and emotional reactivity from just the amount of engagement they have. And, and they feel that if they're unwired for even a moment, they will, you know, there's this term for this fear of missing out, FOMO. And this is uh, anxiety producing and upsetting. The problem is being involved is anxiety producing and upsetting. And I have constant flow of clients through my office with anxiety issues related to these topics. So there's the super distraction. And all of those things are even more significant for the ADHD crowd. So in terms of the ethics manual, you've got your good old five W's and an H that we learned in literature and all sorts of other uh, pursuits in school. And so you want to sit down and have clear guidelines on who can use the phone. And you got to remind kids this, typically this phone belongs to me as a parent, not because you're possessive and controlling, but because you are simply the, the parent, (laughs) you own the phone and you are kindly sharing the phone with the child to use within the parameters. And if you don't say this up front, it's never going to get said. You're going to have to say it repeatedly. But if you forget and don't get this made clear, the kid believes they own the phone more than they do a car, more than they do their clothes, more than anything. They think the phone belongs to them. We've turned these into very personal experiences. Um, What can you use the phone to do? Uh, In consent-based sex education, I do an extensive series of interviews with kids and focus groups. I have a co-author that's an 18 year old high school senior. She has done amazing interviews with kids and they universally estimate that approximately 80%, perhaps even 90% of their peers use their phones to Snapchat nudes to each other. That's N-U-D-E-S to each other. That is that common at this point. So you might wanna have a talk with your kids about that. Um, you might want to have a talk with them about what information they are going to be able to take in. You might want to filter that. Um, I use MobiSip for filtering, M-O-B-I-C-I-P, very effective browser replacement for what uh, your child can download. And the younger they are, the more tightly you want to set those. The older they are, the more you have to sort of let go. Um, When can it be used? We did our little poll earlier. And the two times that are most important, talk about in a moment, are nighttime and study time for when that should not be used. And kids have every excuse on the face of the earth about why they need phones at night and during study time. And I will tell you why they need phones at night is because that's a great time to Snapchat nudes to other people or to text all night. All that stuff about listening to music. Yeah, that's probably true while they're Snapchatting. Uh, I get texts from kids at 2.30 in the morning, logging their thoughts of the night. Well, I'm happy to hear from them, but not at 2.30 in the morning. By the way, I don't read them till the next morning, but they're up at 2.30 in the morning. Um, Where may it be used? Uh, School is a place that we didn't used to let people do this, and they use it now all the time. Maybe not the dinner table. Maybe you don't want them using it at the dinner table. Um, And then I always explain to kids why the rule is being set. Like uh, people think, don't ever utter the sentence because I'm the parent. Just because you're the owner of the phone, which we made clear on item one, doesn't mean you just get to say, well, I said so. Why is that? Because A, it sounds like you're a dictator. And B, who learns anything from I said so? You need to explain because you need to sleep. Sleep is actually important. It's more important than about anything else. Because at the dinner table, we want to engage face to face. So we actually have some time together. And then you can go back to your phone. And then how will the rule be enforced? Don't take phones away or shut them down unless 
there's a clear connection to the ethics manual if they're being misused, uh, if they're being used out of the time frame when they're supposed to be. Keep punishments, if you will, related to the phone. People get mad because they don't like somebody's dating partner and take their phone away. That's just a great way to have a big fight and not not convey any meaningful messages. Um, so the, briefly, the devices need timeouts overnight during study time in deference to others. Uh, you know, kids will sit there and text in the middle of their sister's music concert or at the dinner table or whatever. S decide when you want to be deferent and thoughtful to other people and convey that information to kids. And I think I see families at dinner at restaurants. They're all on their phones. I don't I don't mind that if I see the family is talking about what's on their phone. We do that. We talk about, oh, did you see this new Broadway play that's coming out or whatever? That can be engaging, but too often people have their earphones in or are totally disconnected, and that's not deferent to relationships. Um, and it, all, they need timeouts. This goes back to what I was saying about how to use them as punishment. When the phone is misused, particularly if they're committing antisocial acts with the phone, um, you can decide if you think texting nudes is an antisocial act. I probably wouldn't quite count it as that, but you might also want to use it. Or use uh, You might also want to have the phone pulled back for a brief time if that's something your kids are doing. And I have, oh, the humanity here, because as Wayne alluded in the beginning, uh, this, is the, this is like for when kids, when you take their phone, it's like that video of the Hindenburg and it's exploding and the reporter's like, oh, the humanity, that's how kids feel. They feel the Hindenburg just blew up. And if you start this from the beginning and say this is the natural process that happens with phones, you'll get less blowing up with the Hindenburg and more, oh, man, gee, that's what you're shooting for. Um, geographic restrictions for all kind of screens. Uh, I just don't think people should have a bedroom that looks like mission control. Um, that's an invitation to stay up all night and use equipment. Uh, there are now, you now have on the iPhones, at least, the ability to turn on a uh, device uh, that knows when you're moving, and it uh, will shut off the phone, and it will send a message that says, I'm driving right now. Not only can you turn that on with your kid's phone, but you can make it so they can't turn it off. I def I've been waiting for that for years. Um, I wrote an article for Attitude Oh, a while back, I think it just got published, wishing there was such a thing for that. And now there is. Um, I have studied, people like to study in the place that they can best Snapchat nudes to their friends and not in a place that is conducive to studying. From the beginning, from fifth grade forward, make sure the study quarters are not the electronic broadcast quarters. Uh, kids will sit there and snap and study and snap and study. And all the research tells us, particularly for folks with ADD, that uh, multitasking is a terribly inefficient uh, process. There's that old T-shirt that says, some call it ADD, I call it multitasking. Boy, that's a, that's a dumb joke. That's not... ADD doesn't help people multitask. It's quite the opposite. So try to get kids focused and on what they're supposed to do. And then at the end, they can just snap all they want to. And then uh, this thing where people are using their phones in class, the, this is like kids can't imagine not being able to have phones in class anymore. It varies from school to school, but it's so painful for them when they can't have their phone in class. So why is this hard for parents? Well, the first mistake people make, and they make it all the time, is to wait to act on the phone till there's a problem. Don't ever utter to your child, I'm going to trust you with this until you show me you can't be trusted. First of all, never have a conversation with your child in which the word trust is in the sentence, because kids just aren't trustworthy. That's just not how they're wired. So set the, the plan up and run the plan internally understand there's going to be shortcomings and failings. That's part of being a kid. And don't take that personally, but lay out the plan. Like we said, the who, what, why, where, when, and how, and, and then run that game. Don't wait till you're having problems. 
Um, parents find this horribly inconvenient. <laughs> it's inconvenient to try to run uh, all of the apps you need to learn how to run to contain this material. So just give up. I bet there, I bet, I don't know how many of you, we should have done a poll that says how many of you have a filter on your kid's phone. If you don't have a filter in your kid's phone, if they're 14 or 11 or whatever, they're absolutely going to look at the most graphic pornography that you can imagine. And they're probably not going to tell you that. And if you say, hey, how much porn have you been looking at lately? They're probably going to look at you with horror and be like, never. I've never. What's porn? So we know clearly that is not true. And so out of simple inconvenience, you don't want to just turn out a phone that has no restrictions whatsoever on it. Um, and yet all the time, I, I don't know hardly any teenagers who have a phone that has any filters on it, by the way. Um, parental guilt. Parents, uh, we've gotten to a society where we feel so sorry for our kids. They have such hard lives in America in 2018. And so we don't want to do anything to hurt their self-esteem or make them feel bad, like take away their phone. Or, or Now, to be clear, I wouldn't take away a phone again unless there's a clear connection to the problem of the phone. But restricting it and limiting what they can do with it has now become some kind of article of faith or in the Constitution that kids have a right not to have you do that. Let that go. Let that not be a part of your ethics manual. And kids feel that sense of entitlement. They play on that guilt. This is my phone. Everyone else has Snapchat. I'm picking on Snapchat. I'm not saying you shouldn't get Snapchat because kids can't even communicate with each other anymore without Snapchat. But but kids feeling they're entitled to do whatever they want with a phone because they have it. You want to militate against that from the beginning. And then finally, there's a genuine. I, I, again, I'm very re reticent to use this term addiction, but there's genuine behavioral addiction to gaming and to phones and even to pornography that they get so caught up in that that they don't get around to doing the things they need to do. So here are the containment strategies, um, and some of them are more fun than others. Uh, everything has parent control. As I look out at the Sprint campus, I know you can get on the Sprint website and you can go in there and set a bunch of times and a bunch of restrictions on things. The problem with a smartphone is that won't shut it off of the router. So you're going to have to go into your house and change the router. Um, to have a timer on it to, and that gets complicated because you don't, you can't shut it off during study time. Um, if you get into a situation where you really have a flagrant abuse of a smartphone, and I'm saying just the most serious offenses, there are spy apps that you can pretty much take control of your kid's phone and them not know it. I don't tell very many people about this or how to do it because I think it is mostly unethical, but I think there are a few occasions that. I would use the term probable cause, just like with the government, where spying becomes a necessary part of protecting your child. What is more effective, and I believe me, I've done it with kids, is to say, if you continue down the path you're on, I will teach your parents how to turn your phone into their own personal spy station. Do you want to go there? And that actually will stop kids pretty cold because they can only imagine the amount of invasion of privacy that's going to cause, and they will back off. Suddenly sending nudes doesn't seem like such a good thing anymore. And finally, my favorite is to put the phone in an impound. And you can see the demonstration of this on my uh, website. If you go to dr-west.com, there's a tab that says blog, and that'll take you to our blog, which is familypsychological.com. And you can see my son and I... Um, uh, last week, we did a TV segment on Fox 4 Morning Show in Kansas City where we made this box um, or we modified it. And you can buy this box. I think it's now $54 on Amazon. And there's an, a bigger one that will hold more stuff uh, for, I think, 74 And if you see on the top, it has a little round dial. You turn that dial from one minute to five days or whatever, and then you push the button, push the dial down, and it'll give you a countdown. And when you've put whatever you want in there, and it, and then with the countdown, it's like basically saying, I hope you're serious, and then it locks. And short of a sledgehammer, it's a pretty heavy box, short of a sledgehammer, you can't get into it for that period of time. So how do you use that? Well, how first of all, how we modified it is you can't charge anything in there. 
and you want to be able to charge the phones or a gaming console. So we drilled a hole in it, and you can either put a rubber grommet in there if you can get a thick enough grommet, uh, or the plastic is pretty nice and not sharp after you've cut it. You just don't want anything that's going to scratch the cable to the phone. And you can put, I'd say, probably three or four big iPhones in that case. Uh, and what, where do you, when do you put them in there? Well, at night, you can set it for whatever. You know, It can unlock at four in the morning. Nobody's going to be awake then. And then it's ready in the morning to take out, and it's charged up and ready to go. Uh, this, you can also do this with gaming consoles. You can do it for 90 minutes during study time. This has not only a physical effect of blocking the phone from use without having to get into the whole computer side of it, but it has a symbolic effect in that this is sort of a ritual, time for the phone to go in its box. And uh, if kids complain, oh my gosh, I can't have my music or whatever, you know, you can find them a, a bunch of other ways to play music. This part of this entitlement is kids now believe that because of Spotify, that they, if they need to hear um, Metallica from 1993, then that's what they need to hear right now. And believe me, I do have people who like Metallica. Uh, you know, they must have it now. And this is it, no, there's no research that says people need Metallica to sleep. Um, none whatsoever. We don't need Rob Zombie to go to sleep. So, um, it, this is something that kids sort of have invented as the way to keep their phones on them. I say put it in the box, get it charged up, and you can. the nice thing about it is it has this timer, and if you've used timers with kids with ADHD, it's a really neat gizmo, like tooth, toothbrush timing and going to the bathroom and taking a shower timing, helping them use an external device to really know the amount of time they're using. And this combines that with the locking mechanism. Uh, the one thing I will warn you about is, for heaven's sakes, learn how to use the little dial. Alex and I were getting ready to do the show the other day, and we were going out for coffee before the show, and we accidentally locked the box for 20 minutes. Thankfully, it was only 20 minutes, or else we would have been um, not able to open it during the show. So... That is the conclusion of my talk today. I'll throw it back to Wayne and answer whatever questions we may be having. Great. There are plenty of them. Uh, just a little housekeeping again. The, uh, several parents asked about Moby Sip and what yeah. is that app called uh, that uh, shuts down your phone while you're driving? Is that uh, okay? So that's those are good questions. So let me answer the fast one first. Okay. A Apple's operating system now on the new iPhone, I think it's the newest update, has this built in. And you go in, let me look at it right while I'm doing it. You go into settings and you will find that the first one you'll come to is restrictions. And that will be important to us when it comes to Moby Sip in a second. But somewhere in here, maybe do not disturb, I think it is. Under do not disturb, um, the, on the bottom, it says, do not disturb while driving. And you can activate that either manually or when connected to the Bluetooth or automatically. And I think automatically, it just knows. And you would set it to automatically, and then you would uh, set it so it can't be changed. And that's under restrictions. Mm -hmm. So that's all built into the iPhone at this point. Um, Moby SIP is a you have to pay for it and it's not super cheap but it's worth it and again that's m-o-b-i-c-i-p um i was talking to him the other day there's a few interface issues that i think are are annoying and but generally it works pretty good and so what you do is you, you have to get on your phones and devices and do away with the other browsers which you can restrict um their use especially on the iPhone. Any of those can just be mm -hmm. shut off. Then you download Moby Sips application, you set up an account, and then from your computer, you can get a very detailed filtering system. And what I recommend in consent-based sex education, which is not out yet, by the way, if you're running to buy it right now, give me a little longer and it'll be there. Mm -hmm. I recommend that you uh, actually put some links, whitelist some links, on good sexual information that you think the kids will want to use at some point. 
Um, but you can do that with anything. Like if you don't check the box on Moby Sip about weapons, um, then it will block you from every museum in America because every museum has weapons in it. So it's that complicated and you can go in and set it. It's easy to use, but it's complicated in its algorithm. Then the first day I had my son on this last week, I got a request from him uh, to add a URL. And I looked at the URL, didn't have any problem with it. And you just click on your phone or computer and it will add that URL so he can go to it uh, at will. Um, but so it's, the learning curve isn't too bad on it. It's not as easy as my box, but it's pretty good. And Moby Sip will do what you need to get done. And it also lets you choose and have a conversation with your kid about what you're choosing to uh, allow. Uh-huh. Uh, one parent uh, wanted you to talk about, you were talking a lot about Snapchatting nudes. Yeah. And she, um, she says, please ask Wes to warn parents that there may be criminal consequences if kids share images that can be considered criminal acts. There can be lifelong consequences. Thank you. Is that, I mean, I don't know. So here's the, the truth about that. The okay. truth is that most states, including Kansas, which isn't the most liberal state about sex, have modified all those laws because in all seriousness, if those laws were enforced, 80 um, percent of our kids would be in juvenile court. Uh, mm -hmm. That this is just not an enforceable law anymore. Now that, you know, we can have a very interesting debate about whether that's good or bad. Um, but I think it's where people think we need more laws to criminalize it are the people who don't think their kids are doing it. The minute your kid does it, you don't want these laws anymore. Um, so I think the law is not a good way to solve it. And I think it, if you, your kid gets caught doing this and you think there's any legal jeopardy, for heaven's sakes, immediately hire an attorney. Uh, now, do I know anyone anymore for whom that has been an issue? I do not. There was a time when people didn't understand this phenomenon where they were headed down this path of this idea that boys were, you know, tricking girls into sending nudes. Um, that might've been true upon once upon a time, but girls are, um, are pretty okay with doing this at this point. So mm -hmm. I think it's a conversation we have to have. Um, and, and you want to know your state law, but things have shifted from the difference between producing and possessing. Um, and so that's where it gets really tricky in the law. There's different penalties for producing versus uh, possessing. Mm -hmm. And the, the weirdest part of the whole story is at this point, about a third of all child pornography in existence today is produced this way, not intentionally, but just pulled off of screenshots. So kids need to know how to use Snapchat, but I will tell you they are mighty savvy about it. And we go into real detail in the book about how to know if your nudes are being reproduced and so on. So mm -hmm. it's uh, quite a deal. Yeah. One mom asks, my son seems to become extremely aggressive when he has access to any game consoles or iPad. Yeah. Do we ban them completely? So, yeah, it's a great question. So here's what we know about this. First of all, it, the exposure to violent video games does not appear to increase violent tendencies in people who do not otherwise have violent tendencies. But... The interaction with video gaming uh, experiences seems to cause people to become more aggressive because they get angry in the play. Yeah, do you understand the difference? Like they're not winning mm. and they flip out. And I've had college guys, and I'm talking about people who are getting 3.9s in their business school and going on to get an MBA, take their computer and throw it across the room. And, and break it because they're so angry. They're not doing well at Call of Duty. So, so this is really where this aggressiveness is a concern. People sort of misunderstand. They think if you're shooting people on a video game that this makes you have less empathy or so on. Kids really do understand that's pretend. But what's not pretend is the emotional reactivity that happens because they become so immersed in the experience and they don't like the outcome. And and it's sort of like the it's sort of like the micro achievement. Only in this case, it's like it's like pretend aggression, um, but it becomes very real for them. So I, I have had plenty of people getting concerned about this. The question is whether the person 
carries that sort of behavior out into the rest of the world. And I think the jury's a little bit out on that. But smashing your computer is kind of a bad thing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I know you didn't like to talk about, you don't like to talk about addiction, but there are X number of questions about yeah. how do I figure out if my my son or daughter is addicted to video games? Is there a litmus test? Is there something or is it just common sense that a, that a parent would observe this? I mean, the word the word addicted is thrown around a lot. Yeah. What does it mean in the case of video games or a cell phone? Is there a line that is crossed that a parent can observe and take this whole thing a little more seriously or try to do something? Yeah, it's, it's the golden question. It really is. So yeah. the reason I don't like to talk about it is exactly what you said is because it's so overused. And if everything is an addiction, then nothing is an addiction. And I think we need to hold on pretty tightly to this concept and use it effectively. So that's the only reason I always get edgy about it. The, so behavioral addiction is when a person cannot stop using the desired activity and they uh, continue with it despite negative consequences. Hmm. Now, under that model, um, fantasy football is absolutely addictive. Um, it, it wastes immense amounts of time of people's uh, work schedule. For some offices, the NCAA tournament is addictive because people get too caught up in that and aren't doing mm -hmm. what they're supposed to be doing. So we like to think, it's much more fun to think, oh, pornography, it's automatically addictive. You know, kids are all addicted. Um, that just simply isn't true. There are kids who are over-users of pornography. That article today is a good example in Time magazine. And there are kids, the vast majority of kids aren't are not in any way addicted to pornography. Gaming, I think, is trickier because the, po the whole point of how games are coded, how they are written, the storylines, the whole immersive experience is absolutely knowingly intended to addict you to the game. And, and that just isn't really true of golf or fantasy football or even pornography. So that's the one I'm concerned about because it's designed this way. So how do you know when the, it's gone over the line? First of all, if people have other activities like they enjoy doing or, or force themselves to do uh, outside of gaming, then probably you're in safe ground. If it isn't really about the number of hours they spend. Um, if they're so upset when they're not gaming, that they just can't stand it, that's probably a concern. Uh, when I raised this issue, my son, he's heard me talk about this plenty. And my son actually diversified his interests. So he, he, if anything, he's kind of addicted to informational podcasts at this point. He is always listening to a podcast. Um, because I was so concerned, like he was getting more and more into gaming. And now he's got a much broader array of things he got into uh, science Olympiad, and so on. What I think he sees is the more he does other things, the less I'm going to get bent out of shape about gaming. And that probably is a pretty good measure right there. Do they have a broad, if when they're really gaming, they're gaming seriously, great. And then when they're doing other things, they're not gaming or on Netflix or whatever their addiction. Girls and Netflix, I tell you, that's that's about a behavioral addiction sometimes. <laughs> They've really got to look at what else are they doing? Are they getting up and doing what needs to be done? Are they using video games as like a dessert? I always say it's like a dessert. It's something that's fun to do after you've done all the things that you're supposed to do. And if they can't make that happen, parents are going to have to get probably with a therapist. And it gets brutal. I want to be clear. It is a brutal experience when kids are that far gone on any of these things. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think you might have answered this question in the previous answer. How do you decide how much gaming time to allow for a teen with ADHD? So I think. Uh, yeah, I would try to look at it a different way. I'd try to say that it's the dessert and, you know, how much chocolate cake does anyone need? Well, probably none. But it's more about did you eat your meal? Did you eat your peas? Did you do the things that are difficult? And then gaming is your reward. And that's the best model. And because they are great, gaming is fantastic at rewarding you. 
the mm-hmm. problem is kids want to be rewarded 24-7. Uh, a fair number of parents have asked, you know, they have to go to the computer for a YouTube lesson or something from school homework, and that seems to be the weak point. They get right. distracted from there on in. Is there any strategy you have to, you know, avert that? Yeah, I think that my wife's not only a teacher, but she was the Kansas NEA Teacher of the Year a couple years ago, and she's a science teacher. And so, she and she literally, as I say in the book, the new book, um, she literally introduced me to the internet. I walked into her secret room at the University of Kansas and <laughs> saw the internet for the first time. So she's really on top of this, and she and I both have concerns that schools. On one hand, schools have way overshot the mark on how much uh, they want to engage kids with technology, which just the kids are way smarter than schools are about the technology. So they then take the devices and use them for fun and not education. Mm -hmm. So using on the other hand, nothing's better than YouTube for I've learned how to use every Adobe program there is off of YouTube. It's a tremendous learning tool. So. It, this leaves us with the dilemma that the, the listener is is suggesting. How do we use these tools to engage with kids and then not have them off on videos about skateboarding or cats and sofas? And it's very difficult um, to do, especially for the ADD crowd, where they will just get into hyperlink surfing uh, because it's just one interesting thing after another. Short of standing over them, um, or I think simply having them come to you when they need the link and you uh, authorize their access, there's no other way to do it um, because it's just, it's just a, a technology that lends itself to overuse. Mm-hmm. Uh, one parent has asked, can you say a little more about consequences of non-compliance? I mean, or have you said everything you need to say when uh, the rules are violated? Yeah, so I would waive the seriousness of the rule violation, and I think that's actually quite hard now because there was a time I would have said, uh, if you're sending nudes out, and, and it was back in the era where there looked like there would be serious legal consequences like sex offender registry and stuff, I, w- I would have said that was like the death penalty for a phone. And at this point everyone would have their phone taken away if that was the case. And I know this because I've done all these interviews. Um, So I've probably changed a little on that. So you have to really figure out the gradation of what is a serious violation. And if you want to pull their phone for a bit because they sent nudes, or you want to pull their phone because they're misusing it during study time, that's when it goes in the box. And sitting there together saying, I wonder how far I should turn the dial based on this offense is probably a pretty good discussion to have with the kid. And the kid's like, well, it should be 20 minutes. And you're like, I'm thinking four weeks. And, you know, (laughs) you have some discussion about that. What fits the, the crime? I would also argue for the ADD folks, you, you can get away with shorter punishments. They're painful enough. So if you say, wow, I understand you sent nudes to some random person at school I think we're going to put your phone in the box for a day. That seems like not serious enough, you know, for the Mm -hmm. ADD person. That's like seven years. They're going to just be sitting there thinking at school about the phones in the box. And their friend is like, where's your phone? It's like in the box and they start crying. And it's like the most awful experience that probably to the extent it's possible. will give them some pause the next time. It probably won't stop them. I talk about this in the book about the dynamic of uh, belief. First, nobody wants to send any nudes to anybody. They're scared to death. And then they do it one time and nothing happens. And they realize, oh, this is no big deal. And then they start doing it. Being able to sort of replicate this process of, say, locking the phone up, that will at least give them pause the next time and maybe a time after that. It won't cure the problem but you're at least beginning to get them to think, do I really mean to do Mm -hmm. this? And that's what it comes down to. Uh, uh, Just one quick last question. One parent wants to know, can I see the wording of texts that my son sends out without asking for his phone? I guess she's looking for some kind of spyware 
for that? Well, I <laughs> the answer is yes, and the real question is, do I want to tell you how? Uh, the The answer is it. So I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell you this story. I wasn't gonna tell it. I was gonna, and then I decided not to. So there's a story from World War II that actually is not true, but it's a famous story about Winston Churchill, and that Winston Churchill knew that the Germans were going to bomb Manchester uh, on a certain night because they had cracked the German Enigma code, and they saw this was planned. And Churchill had to decide what to do in response. If he sent up the the, uh, Royal Air Force to intercept the bombers over the channel, then he would reveal that they had had advanced knowledge of this and could have telegraphed to the Germans they'd broken the code. So under this legend, Churchill decided not to respond and Manchester was bombed. Now, that story is totally BS. I had to really research it to prove that, but it's not a true story. But it illustrates a true point, which is if you have intelligence information on your child uh, or the Germans, then how do you use that? And you have a new level of responsibility that you wouldn't otherwise have. One wants to walk into that scenario very carefully. And mm-hmm. so I would n- you don't want to know what your son texts to girls, uh, for example, or boys if he's gay. Um, you don't want to know unless there's something you're going to do about it. And if he texts a picture of his penis to a girl, um, which they all they do, it's like peacocks. They, they just show off their penis like the peacock shows its feathers now. <laughs> and if you want to know that, Okay, then you need to decide up front, what am I going to do? I'm going to reveal my knowledge. And this literally just happened two days ago in my office. Um, I figured out this kid was being spied on. Um, And this is now the kid is angry. She's going to move out. Um, She feels violated. Uh, (laughs) All of her secrets have been taken from her. And the family is about to disintegrate because parents were too scared and started reading things that probably they weren't prepared to hear. So before you do any such thing, think, what am I going to do under A, B, and C? When Mm. consent-based sex education comes out, I will tell you all these things you need to know and think through in advance. I even have it down to where I've scripted conversations out so that you can talk with your kid about all this stuff and have an intelligent conversation Mm -hmm. after thinking it through, because these things come all the time. But please be thinking before you do it. So the answer is yes, you can. Um, And I do recommend in the book that if you're going to go down that path, I tell you a little bit how to do it. And I say hire a tech guru to help you because it, 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 it... you're going to want to have that. And then the next thing is to hire an ethicist because you're going to need him too. <laughs> well, that'll have to be the last question, Wes. That really was terrific. Always fun to do them. And we had a good turnout. And I thank everybody who came to listen today. Yeah. Thanks again for being here and have a good day, everyone. For more Attitude podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com.